Lee, and I'd like to um, welcome you on behalf of uh, Cynthia and her family um, to what is a celebration of uh, an extraordinary life um, of a remarkable bloke. And um, <clears throat> um, there'll be some people to talk to you today and, and um, feel free to, to have a drink um, and please treat it as a celebration because that's what, that's what Paul would have wanted. Um, and can I, just before we get going, a bit of housekeeping, if you could turn your phone to silent or off or throw it in the pool, we're not fussy, um, but that would be great. So, um, look, I knew Paul for, for quite a few years, um, well, decades actually, and um, I was very pleased when Cynthia asked me to, to do this because it's a great honour. And um, one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do, and also one of the easiest, I think. Um, so um, bear with us. <laughs> um, we're, we're amateurs. Um, but I'd like to call on, on Ace now, who's going to say a few words on behalf of the family and introduce some, uh, some other family members. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, first and foremost I'd like to thank you all for being here and it's really nice to see a lot of colour in the crowd. Um, Dad always said he wanted to be celebrated not mourned and he certainly did his part by living a life thoroughly worth celebrating so thank you all for doing your part. Uh, trying to summarise or encapsulate anyone's life in a few pages or a few words is intensely difficult. Uh, trying to do that when that person is your father and who lived a life like my dad did is almost impossible, so bear with me. Um, I, if you give me a few moments, I'll try and paint a picture of, of who my dad was um, to me and to a few other people. Um, and I'll also introduce some of his nearest and dearest who would like to say a few words along the way. <coughs> um, and before I start, I'd also ask that you spare a few thoughts and positive energy for loved ones who can't be here today, uh, namely uh, dad's eldest daughter, Alexandra, who couldn't make it over from London, uh, his beloved sister, Julie, who couldn't make it down from Brisbane, um, and also the extended family of Dad's half-brother, John Bailey, who passed away unexpectedly yesterday. Um, I'd spoken to John quite often over the last few months, and I'll always be grateful for the kind words that he'd shared with me um, after he experienced the loss of his father, who was also Dad's father. Um, my grandfather, who passed away when John was around my age, and he, he really helped me get through the last few weeks. So, thanks, John. Um, I'd also like to thank Janet and Tim Storia for allowing us the use of the beautiful Hopewood house today. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, this is actually where Dad spent much of his youth, so it's where much of his story begins. The eldest of three siblings, my dad, Paul Coburn, was born in 1948, a time of wide-eyed opportunity in the wake of World War II. Dad spent his childhood split between Sydney's eastern suburbs, living with his mother Madge, her husband Lem, and, att and attending Coogee Prep, and this very estate where Madge and her business partner, Dad's biological father, Ello Bailey, had established, housed, and homeschooled the Hopewood family, comprised of 84 adopted children raised with an unprecedented focus on natural health. Jenny Green, one of the original Hopewood children, is here today and will provide more insight into that time of Dad's life. You want to put your hand up, Jenny, if you're yeah. ready? <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, Jenny will give more insight into that time of Dad's life itself. However, it's fair to say that those natural health principles, such as no sugar, no meat, and no alcohol, had a lifelong impact on Dad. Um, <laughs> as I'm sure you'll all attest to, should St. Peter come reference checking, uh, Dad never again touched a single piece of chocolate or maple syrup soaked bacon or a glass of wine ever again in his life. And rumours of him having all three for breakfast, covered in ice cream regularly, are outrageous. And absolutely true. Uh, I recently stumbled across a letter that uh, Dad had written to Tim, the story who owns the house, a few years ago after a visit during which they first met. Uh, Dad spoke of the profoundly powerful and pleasant memories of his time here that came flooding back as he walked the halls and expressed that he was glad to be in those moments alone. In one of life's little twists of fate, it's now us gathered here without him, although I'm sure he will in some way remain with all of us forever. Dad went on in that letter to acknowledge the standards of this extraordinary estate being beyond anything normal, a dwelling created by dreamers for dreamers, and his appreciation that Tim himself was not normal and therefore in good stead to meet the demands. Being called not normal by Dad was about as high a compliment as one could receive. It was a compliment he gave to those he loved and admired most. He gave that compliment to his closest friends and colleagues, the latter of whom, more often than not, also became the former. He gave that compliment in his, his own eulogy of Chris Tyree, his good friend and my late godfather. 
and he gave that compliment often to us, his family, and always with a loving smile. Because in quote-unquote abnormality, Dad saw colour, he saw fun, he saw life, and he probably saw himself. Dad was the type of person who, rather than simply blending into the world, wanted to immerse himself in it, try everything, taste everything, watch everything, learn everything, talk to everyone. In the same folder as I found the letter to Tim, I found a seemingly endless trove of his writings. Countless letters to hospital staff and tradesmen thanking them for their care. Musings, concepts, jokes and half sentences that he had written in, in the middle of the night. I found about 10 pages of poems that he had written. Some were funny rhymes that I remember from my childhood, him singing to us in the shower in his big, beautiful baritone voice. And others I'd never heard, but which perfectly captured Dad's view of life. <clears throat> for instance, I found one called Against Poles, which he'd written at 3am on Tuesday. And it read... To sit about the centre of the circle is a perfect observation point, I've found, from which to view each coming revolution and watch the new beginning come round, from which to judge each segment of its compass and examine every angle for its worth. To settle in the centre of the circle is the finest way to ride this life on earth. That was right above another really touching one called Southwood, which read, Southwood is good if you are a Scot, but if you're a pair of tits, it's not. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Thank you, Dad. Um, touching. Um, getting back to Dad's life story, after Hopewood in around 1960, the foundation built and established the Hopewood Health Retreat at Wallachia, nestled at the foot of the Blue Mountains with a comforting holiday house for Madge and management. They named it Green Slopes. This would be quickly become Dad's escape, his happy place. A childhood friend from those days, Sue Kelly, who is also unable to be here today, has asked me to read a passage of her memories from those times. It reads, Oh Paul, this is hard. Where do I start? I worked out the other day, I've known you for 60 years. It was 1962, I was 8 and you 13. It was in Sunday school one morning when you, your sister Julie and brother Mark joined us. You three were the new kids in town. A funny little town it was in those days. You quite quickly formed a strong bond with our family, the Popes, and you were particularly fond of my father. A fact you relayed to me many times, especially since his death, which hit us all hard. Oh, the funny times we had as kids in that little town, doing crazy things that kids would not be able to do today. I remember my dad giving you an old two-wheeler bike. You made a hobby out of doing it up to be quite magnificent. Then you rode like a bat out of hell, breaking all speed records. You used to phone 109 through the Wallace Exchange and say you were leaving Green Slopes now so, with the, so that we could time you travelling to our house on Park Road, approximately two miles away. Each trip, you'd improve your time a little. It was very funny. My parents were concerned you would have an accident. You were always a wild child, Paul, rebelling against the vegetarian diet with your love of chocolate and bacon. Arriving at our house first thing in the morning with a block of Cadbury for breakfast that my father would coax from you in return for a cooked brekkie my mother would then make for you. I was the annoying kid sister and you the funny big brother. While his teen weekends were spent in Malaysia, during the week Dad was sent to Sydney Grammar School, famed for its rigid conformity and attendant discipline. Uh, he's, we've got some childhood friends of Dad's. Jim uh, McSweeney was uh, Dad's best friend in high school and oh, he's here today, so go Jim. <laughs> um, and when the rigid conformity and attendant discipline didn't work, he was quickly shipped to the other side of the planet to limit the nuisance. Landing at London's Ealing School of Art alongside classmates, classmates like Freddie Mercury and Pete Townsend, Dad wasn't quite sure what to expect. He hadn't heard about the uniform policy yet and so, terrified of being caned as he would have been in Sydney, he turned up to his first day in, at, in full Sydney grammar garb. <laughs> Imagine his surprise then when he opened the classroom door only to discover a fully naked still-life model laying on the floor. As hard as he had tried up until that point, he'd never actually seen a naked woman before. And at that moment, still unsure of what to do with one, he gripped the canvas tightly and painted a portrait of his own thumb. <laughs> True story. However, from that moment on, a volcano of creation and complete release from conformity was the keystone of the rest of Dad's life. With creativity there fostered rather than flogged, he eagerly explored every new door that was open to him. It was during this time that he fathered his first child, a daughter named Alexandra, who he ultimately wouldn't meet until he was 63 in 2011. He also wrote his first book, a car customisation tome, which ultimately was published in 1970. Whether anyone would have trusted Dad to customise their car at that point is another matter altogether, given that he was rolling around London in a Heinkel three-wheeler bubble car. <laughs> he literally rolled it in a nunnery, which is extremely hard to do. <laughs> in a professional sense, painting and sculpture were the initial endeavours, but product design became his major passion, and on graduating with distinction, he set up his own consultancy design field in London and hoped for the best, a sadly futile aspiration. Losing luster as the 60s faded, England offered limited growth, so Paul encouraged a small group of cohorts, such as uh, Mark McGregor, uh, Rob Scott, uh, John Herbert and Barry, um, to come back and join him in Australia. And I believe some uh, Mark McGregor's here today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, there, Post won short-lived marriage to a woman named Maria, and amid a growing manufacturing culture, major manufacturers soon noticed his studio's potential, none more so than Everetti, who in 1972 commissioned Paul, aged 24, to design the original Australian Dolphin Torch, which became the best-selling torch in the world. Lee Blackman, a good friend and former designer colleague, design field colleague, uh, will share more details of Dad's life shortly. Hey, Lee. Uh, in the mid-1970s, Dad was a keen racer himself. He had brought his brother to fly and Austin Healy turned Lenham GT back from the UK before moving to a very capable Datsun 240Z. But it was in 1974 that he would purchase the motoring love of his life, the Jaguar E-Type Roadster. Nearly 50 years and half a million kilometres later, he loved that car until his final breath. And my sisters, my mum and I all still feel Dad's present in it as it sits out the front of this building today. In 1979, Dad had fathered his second daughter, my sister, Kobe, who is, yeah, <laughs> she's quite short, so you're going to have to go straight, you know, <laughs> um, with his second wife, Susie. Susie herself was a colourful character and a very talented black and white photographer whose journey was tragically shut, uh, ended far too early also by cancer. Kobe will shortly share more of her own reflections on Dad. In the early 1980s, after his marriage to Susie had come to an end, Dad spent a few years reflecting himself, living on Sydney Harbour in his beloved Halverson Cruiser, and even escaping to Australia's furthest town from the sea to write and record an, yeah, an album. Uh, he named it after the town, which was Eremanga. He was a beautiful guitar player and singer, and would later lend his voice to both the Sydney 2000 opening ceremony and to the Sydney Opera House, where he sung Handel's Messiah as part of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. In the mid-1980s, Dad would fall for and settle down with his life partner, my mum, Cynthia, looking beautiful today. Uh, an accomplished model and graphic designer in her own right. And my sister China was born in 1986. Uh, and I believe they will both share a few of their thoughts today. China's over here, the tall sister. Um, <laughs> by uh, around that time, Dad was looking for an escape from administrative duties at Design Field and becoming increasingly confident in his writing, except at a $10 bet that he couldn't write a film. The result was Dad won the 1988 Australian Writers Guild Award for Best Feature Film and the lead actress, Rosie Jones, was nominated for the AFI for Best Lead Actress. There was not much he couldn't do. So, naturally, next came the ambitious plan to set the Chinese land speed record in his Jaguar, as you do. Uh, however, apparently even gaining entry to Beijing back in the 1980s required substantial credibility, so he approached uh, Wheels magazine to, for support and was rewarded with much enthusiasm and immediate installation as the magazine's official Chinese correspondent. <laughs> couldn't speak Chinese. All of which amounted to nothing when the Tiananmen Square massacre massively soured China's attraction to the rest of the world. But Dad's novelty inspired the magazine's editor, Phil Scott, who I believe is here today, um, and uh, to offer him a monthly column and freelance worldwide, uh, doing feature stories of his own choice at a wildly generous fee. Think driving a new topless Aston around Provence or Ferrari's latest offering around Tuscany. Uh, which required approximately two seconds of contemplation, occupied him wonderfully for the next quarter century and supplied both parties with sufficient spray of awards to justify all the fun, including five National Article of the Year awards. Of course, God doesn't give with both hands and Dad was punished in 1989 with a son. Me. <laughs> Some of my earliest and fondest memories of Dad are at race meets like Oren Park meeting all of my heroes and to them it seemed like Dad was one of theirs. Dad always stopped whatever press or race prep they were doing and always welcomed him with open arms. Before I knew it, Dad was more of a hero to me than any superstar on TV could ever be. Morley will be back to share some of his story with working with Dad at the magazines. However, I do remember one hard, hot day when I was working in a clothing shop in Penrith and I received a call from Dad. There was a lot of background noise and screaming machinery and I assumed it might have been a pocket dial until I heard Dad yell, Hello, boy. I just ring to tell you I'm driving a Lamborghini around Phillip Island and my life is better than yours. <laughs> and then hung up. Um, and about a month later, I started working at the magazine, to the surprise of no one, uh, and was lucky enough to join Dad and, and the crew on a few joints of my own. Of my own. Those days really highlighted how, how unique Dad was. Even amongst all the metallic madness, while the rest of the crew were squabbling over who gets to drive what, Dad was perfectly content just sitting there in his fold-out chair with a hot chocolate in his hand and a crossword on his lap, watching them fight it out and whispering his observations into his dictaphone. He could see the story coming to life in front of him and it wasn't about the cars, it was about the people and the experience. His final years were spent, in his words, harvesting. He'd earned and deserved a comfortable retirement with the love of his life, my mum, and the grandkids at home in Wallachia. And a growing family, including his beloved grandkids Olive, Luca, Coco, Banjo, Atticus, Fraser, Max, Hal and Leo. He loved waking up every morning with a cup of tea and the crossword, which more often than not he would defeat before the final sip. He loved spending time down with Kaima with Kobe and Chick and the kids. 
especially in his camper van. He loved tinkering in his gar garage, especially inside the camper van. He just loved making every day count. I was lucky enough to be able to move home for the final few months we had with Dad. I spent the best part of every day by his side, driving him around when we felt like it, picking his brain, helping where he needed it, learning when he offered advice or lessons, in the quieter moments, just giving him a hug and letting him know how much I love him and how proud I am of him. <laughs> I was lucky enough to be able to... Um, sorry. For a while, it felt like we were slipping back into normality, that he could beat this damn illness after all. He was such a fighter. I mean, he'd already beaten whatever else his body had thrown at him over the years. Leukemia twice, melanoma, lung cancer already once before. Not to mention diabetes and emphysema, which he usually forgot that he had. And swine flu, legionnaire's disease and shingles, which he told everyone about. He remembered them because they were more marketable, I think. Um, but yeah, he loved trying new things and illnesses were no different. Um, <laughs> but as you all know, this was one battle he'd have to call a draw with cancer. He passed away peacefully early on the morning of Wednesday, November 17, at home in Malaysia surrounded by family and love and music. Kobe and I held his hands as we told him we loved him and that it was all right. As he took his final breath, Dad's eyes opened and met mine. It's a moment that will stay with me forever, but I'm so glad and so grateful that I was able to be there with him like he was for me. <coughs> I'd like to think he was ready to go. He did often tell me in those last few months that he was the happiest he'd ever been. If this is what dying is like, I should do it more often, he said. <laughs> Perhaps he'd just decided he'd already done everything on this earth worth doing, and who could disagree? His CV reads like a boyhood wish list. An award-winning designer, writer, filmmaker, race car driver, recording artist and record holder, a published author, a car test driver and a media personality. Hell, he'd even been a self-proclaimed wine tester at one point. And uh, we've actually hand-engraved 100 glasses with that hand-drawn wine tasting logo. Um, if people would like to take one home today. Thanks to Kobe. <laughs> um, but he was so much more than his accomplishments. He was profusely kind, always considerate, welcoming to anyone and everyone. He was erudite, a polymath who seemed to have an answer for everything. He was creative, stylish, and exceptionally funny and quirky. He was an unflinchingly devoted family man and intensely loving father, a fact made all the more beautiful by the, fact in, by the knowledge that he himself never really had someone who he truly considered a father figure. He was my best mate, my closest confidant, and my most trusted advisor. <clears throat> my dad wasn't normal. He was extraordinary, and we wouldn't have had him any other way. Dad, I know you always said you wanted to be celebrated and not mourned. And I promise you that we'll try, and I will try. <clears throat> God damn. Um, but the thing about love is that it can allow us to feel all the colours all at the same time. I will always celebrate you. I will always mourn you, and I will always love you. Thanks, Ace. That was stunning, mate. Absolutely stunning.